God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to ask you now, if you would, to take out your Bible. Stand with me, if you would. We're going to read out of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This week's message, next week's message, uh, will kind of what we call standalone. However, next week's message will kind of refer back a little bit to what we've heard uh, in our emotionally uh, healthy spirituality series and also some things that uh, Pastor McGregor shared. And then after that, I'm going to start a series on uh, the book of Daniel. And I'm actually very much looking forward to that. Colossians chapter 1. I want to read verses 3 through 6. I'm going to focus in on verse 6 in the message, but 3 through 6 is what we'll read now. If you have it, say amen. amen. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. Can you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. You know, we are approaching... Uh, election season. We're actually already into it quite heavily. And with that, there's been a multitude of, of things that we've seen, uh, seen from people, seen, um, we've seen a lot of animosity. We've seen a lot of division, a lot of hatred, a lot of hostility. We're still dealing with um, just uprisings in our cities and our communities. Um, People are praying. In most cases, I think, uh, COVID numbers are going down. But, of course, that's in the mix. Obviously, we're praying uh, for our president and first lady for their recovery and the number of people that recently has come out with COVID. And, uh, and of course, it's always a reminder for us to be careful out in public, do the things that we know to do. We're thankful for our medical community and those that are still working on the front line to help us all get healthy. But, you know, I used to see things on people acting the way they act. And uh, I used to continue to ask myself, what's happened to people? What's happened to us? You ever ask yourself that? How did we get here? How did we become who we are becoming? And, uh, and, and you, there are things, obviously, that we can do uh, to do our best to have a voice in these things. Voting is one. If you're not registered to vote, I encourage you to. And I do encourage you to vote. Um, and I encourage you to vote, again, as I always say, according uh, theologically, there's things for us as a people of God that are absolutely important. We cannot legislate righteousness. But at the same time, I don't think we should vote for unrighteousness. I think some of y'all might have missed that. We can't legislate righteousness, but we don't vote for unrighteousness. I will never support anyone that supports abortion. I will never do it. Uh, I am an absolute firm believer in the life that, that life begins at conception, that God is the one that creates life, uh, and God is the one that gives us a stewardship and responsibility over life. And yes, black lives matter, White lives matter, brown lives matter, and life in the womb matters. All life matters. And so whenever we think about these things, and there's a number of things that, I, that are important to me, uh, the First Amendment, the right to gather, the freedom of speech, the right to, to bear arms, I can go right on down the line. I'm, I am for the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe any vote that I cast for anyone is someone that also believes that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has the right to assemble. And it's those kind of things and principles that I think we as believers ought to consider when we go into uh, to the booth or however you send, however you handle your ballot. At the same time, no, to get back to where I was going, 
I've come to the realization and, and had all along, but sometimes need to be reminded uh, that we're living in a world of fallen people. We're living in a world of, of fallen people. Humanity turned away from God early on. We see it with Adam and Eve in the garden. And, be, and because of that, there's been a rebellion against God that's affected us. And as the world becomes more populated, as we get more people, as, as things increase the way that they are, there's going to be more and more and more of what we see through man's fallenness and humanity. When, we, when man fell, when, um, when man rebelled against God, we plunged into a darkness, a darkness that has given way to chaos uh, of sin. And the Bible speaks about this in Ephesians chapter 2, that we become people that are sinners by nature. We choose to sin. And the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned. None of us, have, uh, none of us here was born into this world perfect. None of us was born into this world without sin. There's none of us. The, matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 John, if anyone says that they have not sinned, then they are a liar. But, but the issue, though, uh, for God, I think, uh, biblically, is that uh, the issue with sin is not necessarily our action. It's our disposition. It's, it's who we have become and what we do because of that, and our soul has an aversion against God. But there's consequences to that. One is an enslavement. Romans 6 talks about that. I won't turn to every verse that I'm going to refer to. But, but we get enslaved by sin, and we turn from God, and we turn to other things <clears throat> that the Bible calls idols. And then sin masters over us. We become subject to sin. And we start serving the created things and created people even instead of the creator. But there's another consequence that comes with that that nobody gets around, and that's condemnation. Once we get enslaved to sin and become people who live averted to God, condemnation comes. So we're enslaved, and along with that, in slavery is guilt. And when that takes place, then the Scripture talks about this righteous anger that God has toward us who turn from him. John chapter 3, verse 36 says it this way. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's the condition. That's the, the end product of those who reject the Lord, who reject Jesus, the offer of salvation, the offer of life. Jesus is the rescuer. Uh, the reason that we sing the songs that we do is because we celebrate Jesus. The reason we preach what we preach is because we celebrate Jesus. The reason we live the way we live is because we celebrate Jesus. Jesus is the rescuer. Turn to your neighbor and say, he rescued me. We're saved by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. And, and there's, there's the, this term that's not in the Bible that's uh, theological indeed, and many people use the term trinity. It's triune is, is what a word I'd rather use be dealing with the triunity of God because this is what we know. There's only one God, but the Godhead is expressed in three divine expressions, and they're expressed in three divine expressions for the purpose of our humanity. You know what? You better snorkel up because I'm going to take you deep for just a minute, but I'll bring you back to the top, but just, just go down to the deep end with me for just a minute. Whenever we talk about the triune God or the, or the Trinity, we never lose the aspect that there is one God, but there's, there's three expressions of this one God that work behalf of our salvation. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. They're equally omniscient, they're equally omnipotent, they're equally omnipresent, equally eternal and unchanging. They have unique functions that work in our life. It's the Father that created the plan of salvation. It's Jesus Christ that implements the plan of salvation. It's the Holy Spirit that administers that plan. The Bible is clear that salvation originated with the Father. 
He's the one that designed the plan to save and redeem mankind. It was the Father who is the administrator of salvation, and he oversees the process from beginning to end. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked about the Father's role when he said this, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I love that passage because it assures me, just like Jesus rose from the dead, so will I. Can you say amen? Then Jesus gets a little clearer. He says, but no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father, meaning the Father is the one that initiates it. And then Jesus goes on a little bit further and says that all the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast him out. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you ought to be sitting in your seat, watching online with a sense of security knowing that my salvation is not dependent on me. The Father initiated, and Jesus said, everyone that the Father sends me, I'm holding them in my hand for all eternity. And then salvation is brought to fruition by the Son. Everything the Father does for our salvation, he does through Jesus. It's Jesus that brings about the work of redemption. It's Jesus that takes us through the process of adoption with the Father. It's Jesus that reconciles us unto himself. It's Jesus that sanctifies us, and it's Jesus that brings about the glorification in our life. Peter said this so clear. He said that you were once, that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold and silver, Rather, we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. That's why we tell people out of Acts chapter 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, that there is no other way for salvation except through Jesus Christ. You cannot get to salvation through Buddha. You cannot get through salvation through Muhammad. You cannot get through salvation through Joseph Smith. You cannot get to salvation through Pope Francis or Pope John Paul or Pope Tyrone. There's only one way to get to Jesus, and that's through salvation. That's through Jesus Christ and him alone. And then salvation gets communicated by the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that applies the work of what Jesus has done. So we're changed from the inside out. There's a a work of redemption uh, that takes place. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that seals us and informs us that we belong to the Almighty God, that we're children of Him. It's the Holy Spirit in conjunction with God's Word that teaches us and leads us into all truth. It's the Spirit of God that seals us to the day that the Lord has returned. I came up with a little ditty. I don't know if you'll like it. It might go somewhere, but it kind of goes like this. I thought about it this way when I was studying this. God thought, God thought us, thought about us, God sought us, God caught us, God bought us, and God taught us. I think I like that. I think that might go somewhere. I may be able to do something with that. I like that so much, I'm going to do it again. God thought us, God sought us, God caught us, God bought us, and God taught us. Yeah, I like it. It's going to go somewhere. I like that. God is the one that does this work, and he does it through his son, Jesus Christ, and we experience salvation through him. And when we enter this wholehearted, committed commitment to Jesus, that's what we call the gospel. That's the good news. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is a work that Jesus does in us that takes away all my boasts. And the psalmist said it like this in 3114, but I trust in you, O Lord, I say you are my God. So he's the one that releases us. He's the one that takes us out of bondage. He's the one that takes us out of condemnation and gives us the ability to live a life now away from that condemnation and that enslavement to live a life in which we can glorify God. And here's what I know, and here's actually the big, big idea of, of this message. Because of what the gospel has done, 
We're to bear fruit in our lives in every manner of our life. We ought to bear fruit. Every aspect of what we do in life ought to be more fruitful. Things ought to become better because of what Jesus done. You ought to do better financially, even if it's just for the sake of wisdom, because you're applying the gospel in your life. Marriage ought to go better. Child raising ought to go better. Living a life through tough times, through trials, through temptations ought to go better when the gospel is the center of our life. Are y'all following me? When the gospel is the center, it's designed to bring forth fruit in every aspect of our life. Listen, listen to this passage again. This is the one we read. Listen to it out of the New Living. It says, the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace, changing lives and becoming more fruitful. John, John, do you mind coming up for just a minute? I want to do a quick illustration. You know, uh, b- b- uh, working with the uh, football team, I don't know, uh, I only know uh, a lot about football because I like football, but I don't know a whole lot about football because I coach football, if, y'all, if that makes any sense. Poor kids, but we're winning. So, but, the, 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 but the point is there are some things that I know. And, and one thing that I know about linemen, if a lineman is going to do his job, he has to find the center of his body. He has to be in a place where he stands centered. Now, John John is just standing this way, and if I just came along and pushed John John, he's, he's, gonna, he's just going to move. If a lineman just stands there with his feet together, no matter what the play is, he has no, he has no center and no stability. But John, John, just stand like this. Just get yourself a good, a good base. But when he centers himself, he doesn't move as easy as before because he's found a center. Thank you, man. And that's the same thing about our life. We got, if, 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 if you don't find the center and the base of your life, everything will push you and toss you around. But when you find that place of center that everything revolves around, then you find some stability in your life. Can you say amen? I want to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through, uh, through 9. You don't have to turn there, but I want, to, I want to read this. Listen to this. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these, he's given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this reason, talking about what the gospel has done, it's taken, it's, we've been, we've partakers of what Christ has done. We have the nature uh, of God in us, a new nature. We've been called unto godliness and unto goodness. We've escaped the things of the world. But verse number five says this, for, vi- for this very reason, listen to this, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness. Goodness with knowledge. You hear that adding. Knowledge with self-control. You hear that adding. Self-control with endurance. You see that adding. Endurance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things, who's not growing, who's not becoming more fruitful, who's not centering on the gospel. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. If you don't keep growing, if you don't keep adding, and, and if you don't find the center of your life, which is the gospel. If you don't find the center, then you won't keep increasing in those things that God has done. Can you say amen? So we want to enlarge, we want to deepen and enlarge our understanding uh, of the gospel. That's God's means of of that personal transformation in our life. I want to just show you something. There should be a, uh, I want to see the growing uh, diagram on the the screen. And hopefully, I want you to to note this and I'll have to stand to the side. Hopefully you don't mind this. 
but, but I, wa- I want you to be aware of something. There comes a time in everybody's life that you, hopefully, uh, that you come to a place where you recognize that you need Jesus. That's that point of conversion. That's that point where you had that encounter with the Lord or that encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it's because of the cross. You hit that place where you come to recognize the cross. And if you keep the cross in the center of your life, two things are going to happen. One is you're going to constantly have a growing awareness of God's holiness. The more you center on the cross, the more you identify what Jesus has done, the more recognition you have of God's holiness. Are y'all following me so far? At the same time, the more you focus in on the cross and what the gospel has done, there's also a growing awareness of my flesh. In other words, two things happen. The more I live for Jesus, the more I realize how holy God is. At the same time, the more I realize how sinful I can be in my flesh. Are you following me? The, the gospel allows me to continue to see the greatness of God and my sinfulness. I become more aware of my flesh. As I grow in these appreciations, oh, sorry, that's all right. As I grow in these appreciations, then I also grow in my love for Jesus because I recognize, man, God is really, really holy. And I also recognize I'm really, really sinful. So I have to keep the cross in my life. I cannot let the gospel be something that is just a moment of time in my life and I got a truncated view of the gospel. Like I just accepted the gospel because I wanted to be saved. Not that I received the gospel for salvation, but also for my life. Are you following me? If you just have that truncated view and if at that point of conversion, we, we are limited in God's holiness. Listen, I recognize more and more how holy God is. More and more, the more I live for him, the more awesome I see him as. At the same time, the more I live for him, the more I realize I need him because my sinful flesh will try to rise up, the more of it. But one or two things can happen in our life. One or two things can happen. One, somewhere, if we don't keep the gospel at the center, then we begin to minimize God's perfect holiness. We don't see God as holy as he is if we don't keep the cross in the center of our life. At the same time, I begin to elevate my righteousness. If I don't see the holiness of God for what it is, then I begin to make myself look like and feel like I'm more righteous. Can we put the other one up, the shrinking cross, for for just just a moment? Here is what happens. We continue on in this life But if the cross just stays at a level of my understanding that Jesus saved me, then there's a gap between my recognition of God's holiness and there's a gap between my sinfulness or me recognizing my sinfulness. Now, I want you to catch this. If I minimize God's perfect holiness and shrink the cross, I begin to start performing to give the impression that I am as holy as God wants me to be. I start performing. If I elevate my own righteousness to make it seem like that that I'm more than I am, I begin to pretend that I've actually overcome those sinful battles in my life. You go into a place of either performing that you're better than you are or pretending that you've overcome. And let me tell you what starts to happen when you get to this situation. You start defending. This is what it looks like. You start defending. Whenever somebody gives you corrective feedback, you start defending your actions because you want to keep your righteousness elevated and the holiness of God minimized. Y'all following me? You start faking it and just start putting up good appearances because why? You've brought your own righteousness up to a level to where you got to look good. And so you start faking. You start hiding, concealing bad stuff. Because remember, I've set up this, my own righteousness in my head. The cross, sure, it saved me, but, but I'm on my own now. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. Jesus has been good to me. So then I start hiding and concealing things that are really in my life. You start exaggerating. You start talking and thinking more highly of yourself in the things of God. You start blaming others for your sin and your circumstances, and you start downplaying and, and just give a little bit of weight to sin. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. Listen to me. 
We are people who have to keep the hope of the gospel in front of our lives every day of our life. We keep the gospel in front of us. Jesus didn't just save me by the gospel, but my life is the gospel. I've told you time and time again, anytime that I'm not here and I'm at another church somewhere and I'm not preaching, I'm telling you what's on my mind when I walk in that church. Pat, brother pastor, who at brother preacher, you better preach the gospel gospel to me. I need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because I never want to fall into pretending and I never want to fall into performing. Am I talking to the right church? So we don't move away from the hope of the gospel. Listen to what Colossians 1.23 says, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I've been appointed as God's servant to proclaim that gospel. Can you say amen? We don't move away from the hope of the gospel. If you don't focus on the cross and you start focusing without the cross there, and you just focus on God's holiness, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to turn away for, with condemnation. If all you focused on was how holy God is, you will recognize I am condemned. If you don't focus on the cross and you focus strictly on your flesh, you're going to turn away because you'll think I'm totally unworthy. But you put the cross in that and you see God's holiness and you see your sinfulness. You won't turn away from condemnation even though you know he is as holy as he's being revealed to you. But thank God I got the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ which covers my life. But if I, and if I just look at my flesh and my flesh only and turn away on unworthiness, you'll stay in a place of absolute unworthiness. But if you put the cross in there and say, yes, I'm a sinful person, but here is the cross, here is the gospel that's delivered me from all of my sin. We constantly grow in our understanding of what Jesus has done. Let me give you a few more things. And Ben, you can come. I'm, I'm about ready to, uh, to wrap, this, wrap this up. Here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to apprehend a false righteousness. You don't want to apprehend a false righteousness. Your own righteousness, I'm gonna just going to tell you something. First of all, it stinks to high heaven. You know, you know what Isaiah says? Isaiah says your own righteousness is like filthy rags. Yeah, I'll just leave that where it is. You don't want to apprehend your own righteousness. We want to rest in the righteousness that has come because of what Jesus Christ has done. He has declared us righteous because of the work of the cross. Listen in Romans 10, 3, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. And so many people miss this. People fall into all kinds of works. People start doing all kinds. They never feel worthy enough. And they start doing a whole bunch of things, hoping one day God will give them approval. See, that's the difference between Christianity and all other religions. All other religions, you got to work to earn the appeasement of the gods. But not in Christianity. All you got to do is believe that he's declared you righteous because you trusted in him. You don't have to come up with your own righteousness. And I'm going to here to tell you, none of us will never be righteous enough. It's a never-ending cycle. You're going to be just like the typical gerbil that keeps running around or hamster until you run yourself to death. You cannot create your own righteousness. Don't, but if you don't understand what God has done, refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God and trying to keep the law. 1 Corinthians 1.30 does it so good. It says, Christ is our righteousness. Can you say amen to that? He is our righteousness. And here's the second thing. Recall that you're already accepted in God as his son. Already accepted. You know, so many, I, I'm amazed at how many, and maybe, maybe it's fine, it's good. But so many of us need to be reminded, God's already accepted me. He's already accepted me. He's already accepted you. He's already accepted you. You don't have to leave this building. You don't have to get in your car. You don't have to sit in your restaurant. You don't have to lay your head down tonight wondering, I wonder is God okay with me? Listen to me. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's already accepted you. 
There's nothing else you can do, nothing else you can add, nothing else you can change about that. He's already accepted you. And that's part of the good news. Listen, I'm telling you, on a bad day, let, let me tell you what I do before I hit the stage or speak anywhere. I, I may be standing to it, sometimes I'm kneeling, but it's always right before I hit whatever I'm going to do. I even did it the other night before I'd done, a, I'd done a wedding. I do it all the time. I says, Lord, I'm weak. You're strong. But I'm your child. I cannot do and cannot be who I am without you. Nothing that happens here is going to change the fact that you already love me and accept me. Listen, I've done, I've done weddings where I've poured the wine on the woman's dress. I've done weddings where I got their names wrong, put the wrong rings on the wrong person. I can go right on down, drop people in the baptismal pool, done sermons when I got off the stage and think my only hope is that there's another Sunday coming. I've messed up some stuff, but I'm telling you, it don't jack up my mind because I know who I am and I've been accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So we just got to recall, listen to what it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It was always God's perfect plan to adopt us. Always God's plan for us to become his delightful children. He's united us with Jesus Christ. So much love, tremendous love. It just flows over us. It cascades over our life. He just continues to relish us with his goodness. He's done all this through Jesus Christ. We're joined with Christ Jesus, given the great treasures of redemption by his blood and canceled all of our sins. And here's the last thing. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Focus in on his word. Believe what Jesus said. If you say, you know, pastor, I have a hard time reading the Bible. Listen, let me just give you a shortcut then. Go get one of those Bibles that got red letters in it and just spend time reading the red letters. Just read the words of Jesus. Just keep letting Jesus tell you how much he loves you. Listen to me, you dwell on the Word of God, and I'm telling you, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will help you live through this life. You'll grow, you'll, you'll increase in knowledge, you'll increase in wisdom, you'll increase in the understanding of what Jesus has done, and your life will bear fruit because of what Jesus has done. Can you say amen? Everybody stand if you would. Prayer team, why don't you come? We're going to close out with the worship song as we normally do. I'm going to spend a moment here and just see where everybody is, see what we can pray for. Now, I know many of you here probably have already cultivated a relationship with Jesus. And so my prayer for you is just going to be that you be reminded constantly consistently by reading that word of who Jesus is to you and what he's done. But again, somebody may be here, somebody may be online, and listen, if you're, if you're watching us, understand that this message is for you. And in that chat, you can raise your hand and say, I'm making a commitment to Jesus today. Jesus loves you just like he loves all of us that are gathered here together. Nobody came into the house of God by accident. Nobody turned us on online by accident. Jesus wants you to know that he loves you and he wants to save you. Now you might be here today and you may want to begin this life with Christ. You've never began and made a commitment. I want every eye, uh, eyes closed and heads bowed for just a moment. If you're, if you're here and you, and you want to make that commitment to say, you know, today I want to begin following this Jesus. I want to live for him. I need my life changed and he's the one that can do it. I need my sins forgiven. And he's the one that said that he would. If you're here and you want to begin that life with Jesus today, just raise your hand. I'll pray for you right where you are. If this is the first time, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, you two, that, that I do see. Three, God bless you. God bless you. Let's just celebrate what Jesus has done. Father, I thank you. 
Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pray, close us out with prayer, but I want you to know the, the altar is is here for you to come for prayer. Maybe you're one of those ones that say, you know, I, I've I've been away from the Lord. I know Jesus has saved me, but I'm not living for him. And and uh, I'm gonna ask you to come and just let one of these dear people pray for you. They're not they're not they're not gonna uh, be people that are gonna condemn you. They're gonna love you and pray with you and give you some help to be accountable to, to your life so, so that you can live for the God that has saved you. If you made a first time commitment, you can come and let one of these dear folks know. They'll certainly help you on, on the road. If you need healing, you can come. If you've made a commitment to Christ and haven't been baptized, you go ahead and come. Let one of these dear folks know. We'll get you, we'll get you uh, put into the uh, lineup to be baptized. If you haven't received the Spirit of God, just know that these dear folks will pray for you. But you're not here by accident. You're not watching by accident. If you made a commitment there on, online today, just raise your hand. The, the, the moderators, they will certainly follow up with you and make sure you get connected. Father, I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to hear your truth, your word, your message, the gospel. I pray, Lord God, that it does for everyone that's hearing, everyone that's watching, that it bears fruit in our life. Let the day be the day that we're reminded of what you have done, that we just don't stop at that truncated view of the gospel that you saved us, but we allow the gospel to work in our life and bear fruit. Father, you're an awesome God and we love you. You're absolutely amazing and so good. And may your goodness come upon those who are making a first time commitment, those who wanna to return to the faith and the favor of God, those who are God who've been far away but wanna come back to you. Lord, I pray that they realize the goodness and the grace of you. In Christ's name we pray, may the people of God say amen.